Hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to the room. Our next talk is about to start. Um, as before, if you have any questions for the speaker during the talk, please type them in the public chat um, and I, I'll, I should see them and I will ask them at the end of the talk. Um, our next speaker is Bruce Mary, who works at Sorau on the Meerkat radio telescope, which is the precursor to the square kilometer array, um, which is going to be located in South Africa and other African countries. Uh, and if you've heard of the SKA before, then you know that it's it's going to produce huge, vast amounts of astronomical image data, uh, which it's already started to do. And this data is apparently downloadable over HTTP. And Bruce is going to tell us um, how this process was optimized. And Hello. there he is. All right, take it away. All right, so uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Adriana. You've kind of stolen a bit of my first slide, but yes, I work on Meerkat. You can see a slightly old picture in the background there. I say old because not all the dishes are actually built in this picture, but it's a 64 dish instrument. Uh, in fact, in between Meerkat and the SKA, we're currently working on a Meerkat extension, which is going to add another 20 dishes covering a much larger area. Uh, but this is about some optimizations I did just for Meerkat. So, uh, so why do astronomers care about HTTP? Well, Adriana has kind of given away a bit. Uh, we have a lot of data and people want, or astronomers need access to it. So this is a storage cluster at the Center for High Performance Computing in Rosebank in Cape Town. And each of those boxes you can see there holds 48 hard drives. Each of those is eight terabytes. So there's a lot of storage. In fact, it's the raw storage length is about 20 petabytes. Uh, it's a bit less than that effective because we have replication to make sure the data doesn't get lost if a hard drive fails. And this cluster runs software called Ceph, which uh, amongst other things, presents an S3 compatible interface. And if you've ever dealt with S3, you know that's basically an HTTP kind of REST API. And then we've also got a Python library for astronomers to access uh, the data. It handles details like applying calibrations to the data and sort of pulling in the bits of the data you actually want. And if you lets you kind of slice it and dice it by frequency or uh, time, depending on what you want to access. So underneath that client library is access to HTTP. And these machines all sit on a 25 gigabit network. And you know elsewhere in the CHPC, we'll have machines for people to do processing on, or we do our own processing on them, possibly exporting the data into other sort of more standard formats for astronomers to use. So ideally we'd like to be able to make full use of that network. So we'd like to be able to pull data in at 25 gigabits if we can. Obviously that's, you know, we're sharing the network between multiple uh, clients. So they might not actually be able to use all that bandwidth for network reasons, but if there's enough network bandwidth, we'd like to not be limited by Python. So this is probably a slightly different use case from what HTTP tends to be used for in the enterprise. You'll often be, you know, if thinking REST APIs, you might be seeing lots and lots of transactions and function calls or whatever it is. So, you know, you want low latency and many requests per second. Here we're dealing with objects of sort of 20 megabytes at a time. So it's much more about throughput and less about um, request rate. So you know, we went through some exercises to try and figure out how to optimize this because when we started it was kind of slow. But for the purpose of this talk, I kind of recreated some of my research and I just tried to make some benchmarks for different approaches. And for the purpose of the benchmark, I kept things very simple. Um, I didn't run it against the production system because A, I didn't want to disrupt any sort of thing that's happening in production by spamming the network. And also, 
the results wouldn't necessarily be very reproducible because it would depend on what other load was happening on the system. So I basically just wrote, uh, ran a little S3 server on my laptop. I put the varnish web cache in front of it so it would be very fast to access after the first request. And just to make sure I was measuring bandwidth rather than kind of startup overheads, I just said, I'm going to throw a gigabyte at it. So there's a web server on my laptop, and I want to suck out this one gigabyte file and get it into memory as a bytes object. Now, in reality, we do use multiple threads, uh, just because uh, all of those hard drives are bits of spinning rust, and it takes a while for the drive heads to reach the right position and start reading data out. So you need to make a lot of concurrent requests to actually saturate uh, uh, the storage cluster to actually get high bandwidth out of it. But for this benchmark, everything's stored in memory, so I'm going to keep things simple, say just single thread. And then no complications with encryption or encodings or anything. It's just going to be some HTTP headers and then a gigabyte of data coming in on the socket. So this is just to keep things very simple, and we can kind of see, you know, in terms of pure raw bandwidth, uh, how the different approaches stack up. So, um, what we actually started was with Boto, which is an S3 library that sits on top of requests. So for this benchmark, I'm going to start with requests. And I'm going to try and experiment with the um, some audience interaction with a poll. So I'm going to get you to guess how many gigabytes a second you get if you just use requests in the obvious way. So hopefully you can see a custom poll option on the big blue button interface. You can sort of guess. Keep in mind we're aiming for sort of 3,000 megabytes a second as our target. See some numbers rolling in. I'll just give it a minute just to see what people are guessing. Uh, oh, I've got a reasonable sample there, so I'm not going to keep this going forever. So I'm just going to hit the button. And you can see the most popular guess was around a gigabyte a second, followed by sort of ties for anywhere from 500 to 2000. In fact, it's 500. Well, that sucks. We wanted 3,000. We wanted six times higher. So the rest of this talk is going to be about how we can fix that to make it faster. So first option is, well, everyone knows Python is slow, right? And uh, people say, oh, you should use PyPy. It's magic. It makes your Python code just run faster. Is it going to make it run faster? Well, yeah, a little bit. Not really. It's not gonna. It's not the six times faster we wanted. Let's see why else things might be slow. Well, one of the things I've realised is Python doesn't really have a good way of saying allocate block of empty memory and then we're going to fill it in. It's not really optimised for just dealing with big blobs of memory. You've got a couple of choices. You've got the bytes class, but it's immutable. So if you already have one. That's great, but you can't really build one up incrementally other than by copying or joining a bunch of chunks or things like that. Got byte array, which is mutable, but slightly annoyingly, it's zero initialized when you create it. So if you want to read data into a byte array, you're first going to end up filling it full of zeros, and then you're going to wrap over all those zeros with the data you actually wanted. And if you don't know how much data you're going to get, there's bytes IO, which lets you incrementally sort of add bits of data to it, which is jolly nice. So when you want to get the answer at the end, once you've read in all the bits that you're reading in, then you say get value, and that creates a copy of the data. So that also hurts performance. So, uh, but you can still work around things even within these limitations. Uh, the problem is sometimes libraries don't really put in the effort to work around these things. So they end up um, being somewhat inefficient. And 
we'll see sometimes these things work in these very small chunks for no particularly good reason I can see, and that just adds to the overheads unnecessarily. I'm going to dive into the sort of stack of libraries and see what kind of inefficiencies they have. So in the title of the talk, I mentioned unpeeling the onion. Uh, my graphic design skills are not really up to it. So instead of an onion, I've just drawn this sort of stack. Uh, you can imagine Boto might actually be sitting on top above requests. Uh, requests, if you don't deal with HTTP at all, it's a client library for HTTP. It presents a nice, simple interface, which is why it's popular. It doesn't actually talk HTTP directly. It builds on top of something called Erlib3. It adds a few, apart from just a nicer interface, it adds some features like, I think it has a cookie handling and authentication handling. I think it has its own redirect handler even though Erlib3 also handles redirects. And Erlib3 also doesn't actually speak HTTP directly. It sits on top of Python's standard library, HTTP client. It handle, adds some other things, like I think redirects. It definitely handles uh, content encoding, probably a few other things. And again, it's a nicer interface than the layer below it. And then right at the bottom, you've got your actual socket layers that's speaking TCP to the kernel. So let's see where these inefficiencies are happening in the stack. So here's just showing examples of how you'd fetch something with each of these libraries. Um, there is a, I have just today created an open source repository with the sort of full set of benchmark codes. So don't feel you need to sort of copy this down or read from the video or anything. See requests, very simple. We want to get a null and get its content. It does just what I've said. All of three, slightly more complicated because you need to create a pool manager. That's just for managing reuse of connections if you're making multiple requests to the same server, which you can do with requests as well, and it's sort of recommended, but request doesn't force you to. Uh, you can kind of see why you, don't, you actually want things like request in Erlib3. When you look at what happens if you use the built-in HTTP client library, it's five times as much code. And it's not even quite correct because I haven't passed the query bits of the Erl into the request. It's just nasty. And then just see, you know, what is the absolute maximum we can aim to achieve? I did a very quick and dirty thing which works directly at the sockets layer. So I manually push some request headers into the socket. I read the response headers. I find the content length header in the response. And then I sort of read the data straight out of the socket. And that's a big pile of code. And it obviously only works for this very specific use case. It's not, it's not a general HTTP library. So let's see how the rest of these perform. You can see some interesting things here. The good news is it can be done. We can see on the right that just reading straight from the socket, we are achieving slightly over three gigabytes a second. So it's it's not an impossible task. We'll see going from request to all the three, it's sort of two and a half, close to three times faster. Request is definitely adding a lot of overhead in whatever it's doing to wrap all the three. Even stranger is that Erlib3 wraps HTTP clients, but it's going faster. There's something very strange and interesting going on there, which we'll see what's going on. So, start with the requests. When you ask requests for the content of a response, the code it runs looks something like this. So I won't show what's going on in that function, but you see it says iter content. So that means it's iterating over the uh, response content, pulling off these little 10 kilobyte chunks. And it, it's a generator, but it's going to collect them all together, and then it's going to join them with an empty string. So that just means just mash them back together into one big byte object. Problem is, 10 kilobytes is tiny. You know, modern processors can copy 10 kilobytes around or from a socket to wherever pretty darn quickly compared to the cost of executing all the Python bytecodes that 
go into sort of going back and forth to this generator and in and out of C and probably dropping and retaking the gill and all these other things. Uh, the other thing that's not so great is because we're collecting together all these chunks, it means to load this one gigabyte file, we've got now a gigabyte worth of 10k chunks, and then that bytes.join is then going to allocate a second gigabyte and copy all the data across, which means that we've temporarily got two gigabytes in memory, even though we only actually wanted to fetch a one gigabyte file. So let's see what happens if we just increase the chunk size. So I basically just monkey patched my requests library. And on Python, it doubles the performance. So that was easy. Uh, sort of got to wonder why did they use 10 kilobytes in the first place if you can get so much better performance. I haven't looked at why PyPy has then become slower than C Python, but see it. There's a general pattern here. PyPy really doesn't accelerate this problem particularly well. And we generally use CPython anyway because most of our code involves NumPy and SciPy and Dask and kind of whole scientific stack, which doesn't play particularly well with PyPy. Okay, so that was request. Let's see what happens further down the stack. Oh, first of all, there's another alternative to this chunking approach which is when you request the all with requests, you can pass the stream equals true parameter. And what that does is it says, don't go and suck in the actual content of the response yourself. I will manage sort of reading in the response, maybe a piece at a time. Maybe, for example, if you're fetching a video and you're going to sort of play the video as you uh, sort of stream it in. Then we say, no, just kidding. We're gonna, we want the whole thing all in one go. So that resp.raw is the earllib3 response object. Basically, we've now managed to bypass the whole request wrapping with iteration and chunking. We've just gone straight to earllib3 and said, give me, give me some bytes. And sure enough, that gets us to kind of about the same performance as earllib3. Slightly slower, but it's probably within the noise. Okay, so that's why requests were so much slower than LDIP3. Let's take a look at that weird thing we saw with the HTTP client where it was actually slower than LDIP3, which wraps it. And the key point is that there's multiple different ways to ask HTTP clients for data from a response. You can either tell it how many bytes you want, and it'll read first that many bytes, or you can just not give it an amount and it says, I want the whole thing. And in the sample code that I had several slides further back, I gave it an explicit amount. I took the length of the response. Now, the implementation uh, has different code paths for those. If you specify how much you want, it creates a temporary byte array, reads data into it, and then turns that back into a bytes object based depending on how much it actually managed to read. So firstly, as I mentioned earlier, when you create a fresh new byte array, Python is going to zero fill it. And it's actually worse than that, because for, certainly for a gigabyte, what's going to happen is Python is going to say to the kernel, please, Mr. Kernel, can I have a gigabyte of data? Um, the kernel will say, sure, here you go. And I'm glossing over a few steps here, but the kernel for security will actually zero fill that data so that if the memory had previously been used by some other process, it's not going to leak into your Python process and let you read all the secrets out that some other process previously stored there. So the kernel is going to zero fill it, then Python's going to zero fill it again, and then we're going to write over all those zeros with the data we actually wanted. But that's not great. I wonder it's slow. And then, once we've got all the data into this byte array, we don't actually want a byte array, we want some a bytes object. And this memory view trick is, in the end, going to make a copy of the data. So we've now written the data zeros twice and then made a copy. So of course, it's slow. 
So the other option, well, I should say I use that particular method because that's indicative of what requests would have been hitting under the hood when it was using the chunked approach. So because it's asking for 10 kilobytes, it goes down that code path, and those 10 kilobytes go through that very roundabout route. Now, what ILLib3 is actually doing when we ask for the whole thing is it's not passing a length. It just says, give me everything. And I've left out some steps here again, but ultimately that goes down into another function inside the HTTP client, which is chunking again. Only good news is, at least this is not doing 10 kilobyte chunks, it's doing megabyte chunks. But as we saw, it's better, but you still don't really want to be chunking. So, this figure on the right, uh, HP client NA, NA stands for no amount. That's showing what happens if we don't tell it how much we want. And that's kind of on a par again with where LLIB3 was. It's not surprising because that's what LLIB3 is wrapping. But we're still more than a factor of two away from where the sockets were achieving. So let's see if we can improve things further. Well, what if we just upgrade Python? So I filed a bunch of bugs on some of these issues I've seen. And 3.8, there was a change that safe read function got cleaned up so it no longer does that chunking. It'll just read in one go. You can see performance is right up there now. And then more recently, I filed a ticket on the fact that it was doing this read into a temporary byte array. And I submitted a pull request. It's been accepted into master. It what didn't make it for... 3.9, so hopefully it will appear in Python 3.10. So if you're prepared to upgrade your Python, uh, great. Uh, time I was doing this work, we were probably still working with Python 3.5, maybe 3.6, also even 2.7 that hadn't reached end of life at that stage. And this is a user-facing library, so we kind of like to support users still using these older versions of Python. So just to fill in sort of all the gaps on this graph, it's basically showing that uh, firstly, if you just use the naive thing in requests, it's not great no matter what Python you're using. PyPy, uh, the latest PyPy is still based on 3.6 as far as I know. That's why it's doing at most as well as 3.6. Seems to be slightly slower for whatever reason. But as long as you've got Python 3.8, things are good. I haven't shown 3.7 or 3.9 on here because they don't really improve the previous versions in any of these graphs. Okay, so that's the request stack. Uh, we didn't really want to stop using requests because we had some investment in it and it kind of the exceptions we we're raising from our cat Dell library were requests exceptions. So if we switch to a different library, then that changes that public interface. But just for this talk, I had a look at uh, some other libraries. So these are all asynchronous libraries, or they, some of them support synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, to be fair, if you're doing an asynchronous approach, you're at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, if you were in the previous talk, you would have seen that you can't block uh, the thread, if you, or you can't block the interpreter if you're using asynchronous. So which means you can't tell the kernel, please just give me this whole gigabyte in one system call. You kind of have to take bits of data as it arrives and put it somewhere and possibly collect it all in a buffer. Even so, some of these libraries are artificially chunking things in ways that they shouldn't really need to. I think both HTTPX and Tornado work on 64 kilobyte chunks. So none of these options are looking very good for Python 3.6. So let's change the rules slightly. Uh, as I mentioned, we're using NumPy and all those things quite heavily. So we don't necessarily actually want a bytes object. Ultimately, what we're going to get is a NumPy array. And in fact, these objects we store in the object store are really .npy files, which is basically just a little header which says what shape and type the data is and then the raw 
a data in the array. So for this example, I'm using a function called np.empty, which is a little bit like the byte array constructor in that it just gives you a big chunk of memory. But the difference is it doesn't zero initialize anything. So this should reduce the overheads. We're now just getting some memory. We're not zero filling it. We're bypassing requests. We're going straight down to all of three and we're saying just read into this big chunk of memory. So let me see if I can do this poll again. Um, if it will let me repeat it. Uh, okay, let's just see where people think this is going to go, just for a bit of entertainment. Okay, so I've started a poll again. Let's see if you can guess what that's going to do. Okay, so some results coming in. Well, I'm not going to control day, so let's just call it there. So, most popular option seems to be one and a half or two and a half thousand byte, megabytes a second. In fact, that's disappointing. Uh, so, what's going on here? This should all be nice and direct and no temporary copies. Well, this time it's ILLib3. So far, ILLib3 has been the thing that does everything right, but here's how it implements that read into function. It creates a temporary array uh, by calling the read function. And then it copies from that temporary array into the thing you asked it to read into. This is the opposite of what HTTP client did, which implemented read in terms of read into. Now we're reading, implementing read into in terms of read. And that'll probably go down into HTTP client and then be implemented in terms of read into. So we've probably got two temporary arrays going on here. Ah. <sighs> We can't win, can we? So we're going to do something nasty. We're going to reach inside old of three and use its sort of private member variable called underscore fp, which is the HTTP lib, or sorry, HTTP dot client um, response object. So normally this is a bad idea because a it's a private member, so it's subject to change at any time. And also, in practical terms, uh, it means you're bypassing some things in Lib 3 like handling content and coding. So if the response was, for example, gzipped, then by doing this, you're suddenly now reading in gzipped data rather than the uncompressed data. So we've put in some checks in our code to make sure that this member actually does exist and that make sure we make the request and say we don't want any content encoding. We check that it's coming back with no content encoding, various things. And then suddenly, bang, we've got the three gigabytes a second we were aiming for. So it's, the good news is we managed to make it work. The bad news is it's a little bit hacky and prone to break. But at least when it does break in some future Python version, we can say, well, it's a future Python version, which actually uh, supports what we want to do and we can just switch over to that or we'll put in some check based on what is the current Python version. So I think that's basically it. So my takeaway message from this is people who write HTTP libraries have not optimized them for throughput. Don't expect that because it's a big library that thousands of people use that it's going to give you the performance you need. You may have to uh, bypass some of its wrapping or hold it in the right way or sort of use a new Python version to make it work well. Good news is sometimes you can get around it. And that's basically all I have to say. Uh, I've just left some links here. So the top one has is the uh, code I wrote um, you know, from that slide, but also uh, you know the whole sort of benchmarking tools I wrote to produce all these graphs. And then the rest of this list is various bugs I've filed on these various sort of performance issues. Some of them have now been fixed, some of them haven't. So if you're feeling energetic, you could always create a pull request for something. And I'll leave it there and pass it to Adriana to read out questions.
Thank you, Bruce. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. Um, There's a question from Mpo. Um, do you know why the request library uses uh, a 10 kilobyte chunk size by default? No, I do not. Um, also, even try to figure out why it uses iteration of chunking for uh, reading if you ask for the whole thing rather than just saying read the whole thing. And I went back through git blame and it seemed to about eight years ago when the library was first being started, I think before it was possibly even released, it said, just give me the whole thing. Um, and then it got changed to this chunking thing. I don't know quite why. I did have a quick check to see what happened if I changed it back, but then some obscure unit test, I think, to do with content and coding fails. So if I feel energetic one day, I might have another go at it. But requests is not really under active development at all. It's considered sort of complete and like they're only doing bug fixes so I don't have huge amount of confidence that it will ever be fixed. Okay and then we have another question from I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly uh, Jai Shiel. Um Do you use any profiling, profiling tools for these metrics or just the default Python perf timer? Yeah so for this talk it was pretty much all just um, I think just not even the Perf time was just sort of time dot monotonic, run the thing five times, get time dot monotonic again, just measure the time. Uh, I can't. I probably would have looked at some perf tools um, back when I was originally trying to figure out where the problem was coming from. Um, another question from Paul: uh, How did the how did using sockets turn out? Uh, you mean working directly with sockets? Well, that was on a slide with um, right near the beginning. So there, that slide. So you see what we achieved at the end was just over three gigabytes a second, which is pretty close to what working directly with the sockets would have given you. But that's not really a long uh, flexible solution because you know I was hard coding all the request headers and hard coding what I expected the response headers to be and not dealing with authentication or anything. Cool. And we have a question from Johan. Um, how long did the original investigation take? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, probably a couple of weeks, I would guess. Uh, this was a good year or two ago, so I don't recall the details, I'm afraid. And... Um, Another question from Ian. How much of a CPU load are you seeing at the maximum desired throughput? Do you think this could be lower if you had used a different programming language? Uh, so the CPU is pretty heavily loaded, but once you've got sort of all these overheads out the way, uh, it's pretty much turning into a system call, you know, just a single read system call. And that doesn't really matter what programming language you use because that's basically sitting in the kernel copying data from a buffer in kernel space to a buffer in user space. Cool. Do we have any other questions? There seems to be uh, people are having trouble accessing um, the, one of the GitHub repos. Oh, I think maybe I can see it because I'm in the like one of the SKA groups. So I think it's a permissions issue, but we can fix that later. Um, are there any other questions for Bruce? Anyone else? Going? It should be a public repo. Let me just check quickly. Uh, Bruce is debugging your repository issue in real time. <laughs> yeah. Um, access, uh, oh, yes, it is private. Why is it private? I'm sure I created it public. Ah, um, problem is about to be resolved. Let me make public. Uh, okay, I have to type in the name of the repository, which is a bit of a mouthful, but. Right, it should now be public. Cool. Uh, and there's one last question um, from Johan. How responsive are the maintainers about the bugs, and did you get some pushback? Um, yeah, it's been sort of a mixed experience. So, some, so Python itself, on these issues, I've had reasonable 
responsiveness. Um, probably helps that uh, you know the first bug I filed, uh, someone else you know Python sort of core dev fixed, and then when I filed the next one, I sort of pinged him directly to say, you know, so it's related. Um, would you look at my PR? Uh, I have in other cases with Python, there's I've got PRs that have just kind of died, and no one's you know, can't ping the maintainers, and nothing happens. Um, yeah, Ulib three. I haven't really had any response on the request one. I haven't really had any response on. Cool. Um, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, that was a cool talk. Um, some. Let's just see if this works. Yeah.